working with a bunch of different people yeah. on an open source textbook uh, that is a comparative analysis of heterodox techniques and orthodox techniques. Yeah, and just a quick shout out, uh, Eric Dean's not here. Um, he, he really spearheaded this this project in a major way, and so when you're, whenever you're working in a, a group, sometimes some people can give more than others, and I, I think he deserves credit for getting a lot of this project. Yeah. Eric has definitely been the, the leader on this project and the original recipient of the funding to uh, get the project off the ground. So, so basically, so the context behind this is that Eric works at a community college in Oregon, and his students tend to not have a lot of money, okay, as one might expect, and uh, you know you sort of. You sort of step back and you look at the problem, and you know, when your students are paying, um, they're taking out loans to go to school under the premise that if I just do this, then I'll get that good job someday. And Eric knows that that's not necessarily true, right? Uh, you feel like you want to do something about this, so he appealed. Uh, him and Justin Alardo wrote a grant proposal, who's his colleague at Portland Community College, the state of Oregon, for an open education resources project. And so we got some money together. And uh, they supported, uh, they had a nice little um, Amy, uh, I forget her last name, but uh, Amy, hmm. well, uh, there was a nice support staff helping us sort of navigate the kind of paperwork and all that, but basically we got a grant set up and they said, please pursue an open source textbook, and that's what we did, okay? Um, and so, you know, the, the basic idea here is that it has to be Creative Commons licensed. And any sort of materials that we use have to be in the public domain, or get, you know, yeah, it just has to be in the public domain. And anyone, and so anyone in this room can take this book, modify it, build upon it, copy and just redistribute it. We're not asking for any sort of ongoing rights to this or anything. So, um, but most importantly, we view this project as like a going concern, something that lives on. So hopefully, um, it's less about us and more about the broader community. <coughs> yeah, I think that many of us, you know, when you want to teach the alternative perspective, there, you know, the material selection choice is rather limited, especially for something like a micro theory textbook. <coughs> so, you, you know, in my teaching usually I use a standard micro theory textbook, and then there's supplemental readings from blogs and newspaper articles and some academic journals, but for an uh, intermediate undergraduate student, there's not a whole lot of articles that you know are really uh, the appropriate reading level, and it's got to be appropriate or they don't read it. <laughs> uh, so this is a way of, you know, it's really, for me, I wrote the chapter just so that I would have something official for my students to read, uh, it's with, uh, specifically with regards to money. Uh, and different methodological techniques, etc. And it's been a, a tremendous resource for me to be able to bounce back and forth and you know have some standardized material to develop lectures and things like this from. So, so I mean, I think the benefits are fairly clear when you look at this model. Um, you know, there's no cost to the student if you distribute it digitally. You, you know, student, you assign the textbook and they just have it for free. Um, you know, you can, there's, a, there's a, sort of a nominal cost involved with getting it printed, but that's far less expensive than buying a textbook, even illegitimately buying a textbook, and we know that that, that happens. So, um, so I think with, we're using the press books uh, format, and I think that they offer like a, you know, $19, maybe $20 print version for students to purchase, but really you can, you can distribute this as uh, PDFs and whatnot. Um, and, you know, again, going back to the problem that this is trying to solve is that you know we've we've just looked at textbook inflation over the years. I mean, so publishers are really the end in view used to be about publishing materials for pedagogy to help students learn. Now it's about making money and generating rents off of you know sort of intellectual property. And you know they issue a new version every couple of years, and it's largely cosmetic. They just change a few graphs, update a few numbers, but the core fundamental theoretical aspects of it. Uh, you know, don't change for, yeah. for decades. My so theory hasn't changed in a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> Utility maximization is the same. Right. Uh, and then you, you know, and 
you know, the, the standard textbook model is really trying to uh, fill the gap that's left behind when full-time faculty are no longer hired for academic positions. I mean, that used to be the job of a faculty member. You develop good, robust load, notes, you spend a lot of time developing you know, your research and bringing your research into the classroom and trying to, you know, engage your students. But, um, you know, who has time for that when you're bouncing around town to five different jobs? Because you're adjuncting and trying to make it work that way. So, I don't know. So, we're, we're really trying to do violence to that structure, in fact, by, by saying, let's, let's do an open source textbook. Um, you know, and it's not cheap. On average, students pay something like $1,200 a year for textbooks if they're doing it, if they're buying all the books. Especially okay? in economics. And they, you know, get the edition that they're assigned. Um, oftentimes, you know, if, if anyone's taught before, they know that, hey, professor, can I get the previous edition? And you say, I know it saves you a lot of money. I can't guarantee that the, the page assignments and the chapter mapping is all going to play out. And so some students have anxiety that if they don't get the book and they don't spend their hard-earned money on the book, then they may not do as well in class. And so, again, this tries to fill that gap. And the, the open source, one of the uh, real beautiful things that I've been able to take away from it is this uh, integration of new material new ways of looking at, for example, the Megacore for uh, institutional analysis. I can just pull a module from a different chapter and just present that or uh, upload that as a PDF for my students to read. And it's a uh, very digestible, small amount of material. It's very easy to update and change uh, lessons and homework assignments and writing assignments. And so right now, one of the projects we're working on is some fundamental simple questions and definitional sorts of materials and then larger essay sorts of questions that would be cover the, the span of the, the readings and have them do some uh, comparative analysis of the way that uh, both approaches are looking at how economies work and operate uh, from the micro level. So, I mean, we, we feel like it's beneficial to have active engagement as an instructor, as a professor, uh, with, with the crafting and ongoing um, revision of your textbooks. Um, we feel like that, that kind of distances and, and, and sort of tries to undermine that kind of individualization, atomization of, of this sort of neoliberal project in higher ed, um, where you sort of have like this kind of authoritarian, um, you know, textbook apparatus delivering you to, uh, delivering to you content and you're just passively taking it and sending it back on to students. Uh, we kind of don't like that model. Um, so we're, we're kind of hoping that this that this will be um, uh, successful in that regard. Okay, so. So really our next steps are continuing to find funding to support the project and moving forward. Just, uh, you know, there are real time constraints involved not only in the construction of your courses, but in research, and many of us are on tenure track positions, and so one of the lessons, I guess, that we can probably move forward, I think we're stealing a lot of time. Yeah. Here. Uh, you know, one of the real constraints that we face is that, for example, my book chapter here, because it's an open source text, isn't being considered as a work of scholarship for my tenure, and this is a publication that's being <coughs> used in classrooms, and. Uh, we believe that this is a very important contribution to the literature, especially with regards to teaching. So the more people that we can bring into this community that's sharing their uh, utilization and the benefits of this in their classroom or how they've changed it to better fit their needs, uh, that sort of dialogue, I think, would be a very helpful uh, factor in not only achieving more funding for uh, the construction of these sorts of materials, but also toward that end of promoting this type of teaching and work in our classrooms uh, for job security and those sorts of issues yeah. as well. Yeah, that's it is good. So we, we should probably talk about the actual textbook for at least a few minutes. Um, so what we did was we looked at um, an existing open source textbook, and they're out there, all right? So that's, the, and that's the spirit of it. You, know, you, start with, you, you start with what exists and make modifications and changes as necessary. So OpenStax, um, has a principle of economics textbook that's both micro and macro, okay, but it's all neoclassical content, all right? So what we wanted to do was say, let's start from there and then add as much heterodox and critical analysis uh, that we, we can. And so these are the chapters that we added. 
Um, you know, we start off by defining economics in a plural sense. Okay, so uh, you know, we move away from that kind of um, you know allocation of scarce resources towards competing ends definition towards one of social provisioning, which which helps frame the chapter going forward as being an institutionally grounded project. Uh, there's a chapter on value theory that sort of challenges a little of utilitarianism, um, and then you move directly into interrogating, you know, problems of consumption and production in the firm uh, from, you know, a historical and uh, institutional background. Um, there's an economic history chapter on uh, the rise of big business. Um, that's probably the worst chapter in there because I wrote it, but. Um, <laughs> And then you've got like a sort of um, heterodox micro, the cost and prices approach that you know many of us were students of Fred Lee, so we, we carried that through in, in, into the into the work. Um, and then I think the next chapter, uh, Ben wrote this chapter on money and the theory of the firm. Uh, and then we have yet to write this final sort of economics of globalization and trade. Um, globalization and there'll be a public goods sector, public goods sort of analysis. Um, yeah, it's really rounding into a nice set of chapters and now we're selecting the orthodox chapters to incorporate and interweave in between these yeah. and slowly going through and editing all of them that say in economics to in orthodox economics. Right. So it's very clear right. to the student what yeah. kinds of economics we're talking about throughout. And we go back, I want to emphasize the modularity aspect of it because this is like a 700 page textbook. You know, you don't, you don't just give that to students and say, all right, autodidact. Um, we're pulling out pieces and they're sort of standalone in, in many regards. Absolutely. And then Ben kind of touched on some of the lessons from it, um, you know, with, with the sort of, you know, doing this kind of work is not valued for a tenure case. Um, but I'd also like to point on a number of other, other things that we learned through the, the process. Um, is there a pros and cons of taking a pluralist approach as opposed to saying, Forget you know classical economics. We're going to have a wholly standalone heterodox approach, and there's a debate about that in the literature. And we're not trying to settle that here. As a community of practice, we settled. We, we said, said well, we'll do the pluralist thing for now. We'll see how it works. But it can do. It can pre present some pedagogical challenges in the classroom uh, on, on the nature of, of pluralism versus just heterodox uh, uh, on its own right. Um, you know, coordination amongst co-authors who live in different continents and time zones can be challenging. Okay. And again, it's this is over and above your own workload. I don't even work in academia, I, but you know, so I'm, this is kind of like in the evenings when I have time off. I can't do this at work. Um, you know, Ben's going up for tenure here soon, and uh, so it can be difficult to sort of make sure that we're all on on um, uh, on the same page. But it was a good reminder that you know, if some of us didn't have time, someone else jumped in and stepped up to the plate and said, "I, you know, let's keep carrying the ball forward." So it was a good rem reminder of the sort of balanced potential, of, you know, cooperative social labor. So, a little radical plug there that I couldn't get up, get away from. But um, you know, going forward, uh, the idea is that this is a living, breathing project. Instructors will use it, get real-time feedback from their students, yeah. and, and and make modifications as necessary. And then, this is this is yours now. Uh, so you can take this, you can use it however you see fit. Take my name off of it, fork it in any direction you want to go. Um, we'll see what happens. Thank you. Um, so my name is, is it on? It's on the camera, but you need to speak up. Oh, I see, okay. So that's just the fake one, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. So um, my name is Yan, and I'm an associate professor at um, Willamette University. Um, so um, I'm also at Oregon. Um, so um, when Fidel proposed this panel and, you know, kind of invited me to join the panel, and I thought it was a great opportunity to, to kind of, um, in a way, do some propaganda, right, about my department and the new curriculum that we have, and also try to solicit some sort of suggestions um, and, and sort of input as we go forward. The reason for that is um, we just had a sort of new economics curriculum at Willamette University. Um, we sort of pluralized the program, right? Thank you for the sort of the 
just a little pitch about you know plurals, pluralism um, approach to economics. So what I wanted to talk about today um, briefly is first of all some of the rationales of my department's um, sort of reform. Um, and then I want to talk briefly about the process and then the cur current program and then the challenges that we are facing now, right, which is where I would like to get your input. Um, so first of all, about the rationale of the change. Um, so from the very beginning, uh, I was hired in 2009 um, to Willamette University. And at that time, we have a department that is very much mainstream with a few courses that have some kind of heterodox band, right, like history of thought. Um, and But the, the department faculties, um, we have a couple heterodox trained faculties from Utah State, um, from um, Fort Collins at Colorado, and I was hired. I was from UMKC. Um, so once we were, you know, um, together, right, when, when I was talking with my department um, colleagues, we felt that we all have some kind of dissatisfactions with our pro old program. We have very clear program objectives. We want our students to be able to recognize economic the theories as arguments. We want our students to be able to ask big questions, right, like Julia Nelson's words, right, in, his, in her um, articulation, right? We want the students to be able to ask relevant economic question, questions. Um, we also want them to be able to analyze arguments and apply them. And finally, we want them to be able to articulate and communicate their ideas. And the mainstream program, the neoclassical sort of heavy program, does not deliver any of these objectives, right? The students try so much time, master the um, neoclassical approach, right? They're so unhappy. Um, about you know the technicalities of the approach and the irrelevance of it, um, they don't really know how to ask questions, right? Once they get the theories, we kind of hammer them, we you know whip them to trying to apply the theories. So for them, it's like you know they have the hammer, they're looking for the nails, um, and so you know we understand that you know dissatisfaction, and we want to make some changes. So we started really in earnest um, in 2011 to trying to reform the program. But we chose that time because mainly um, some of the most resistant colleagues, they retired. <laughs> so sort of like, you know, Thomas Kuhn's scientific revolution, right? You, you wait until the old forces, you know, go away. And so we started in 2011. So in summer 2012, we invited some, um, you know, heterodox folks from, you know, for example, Bartnell College, Rollins, uh, Hubbard and William Smith College, uh, Franklin Marshall. So we had the symposium. We kind of um, asked this, um, heterodox teachers to talk about their experiences and we kind of learn from them. And so after that, in 2013, we started to, to really reform the course. So the result of our deliberation is we're going to keep the current structure of the program. In other words, we have the same kind of pretty standard structure that we start with an inquiry, which is the introduction level course. And then we'll move on to um, the um, macro and micro theories, and then it's the electives followed by advanced topics, which is the precursor to the senior seminar where students write um, their senior project. So we keep the structure, but we then um, reform the individual courses. So for instance, we get rid of the micro principles of micro and macro. Um, we uh, use the so-called economics inquiry class as a substitute. And that is a sort of a combination of micro and macro with sort of political economy approach. We use uh, E.K. Hunt's textbook, uh, <coughs> History of Thought, and we'll talk about the challenges of using that textbook. Um, if you guys are interested, I'll talk about that maybe later. Um, so that is our principal level course. Um, and then at the micro and macro level, um, we're still you know, ref remaking the courses as we go. Um, the electives, we start to offer um, courses like um, economics of race and gender, um, race, uh, sorry, gender and economic development, um, discourse on economic inequality, history of thought, um, a whole list of um, electives that have, you know, sort of um, heterodox approach um, to them. Um, and then we pretty much keep the same advanced topics with different sort of substance. For instance, when I teach um, advanced topics, I teach global financial crisis. So again, I use a lot of post-Keynesian institutionalist theories to um, you know, kind of deliver the course. Um, and then that's sort of our new curriculum. So that's the 
um, yeah, that's what it's like right now. And then the challenges going forward, um, one is, of <coughs> course, um, trying to offer different courses giving our current resources. So we have seven faculty members in the department with about 40 to 50 majors, um, plus a very heavy sort of, you know, as some of you come from the liberal arts colleges know that we have to offer a lot of sort of so-called gen ed, general education courses. Um, so we stretched pretty thin in terms of faculty uh, resources. So we have to kind of repeat to teach certain courses every semester, uh, we like it or not, right? And so it limits our capacity to offer different electives. Uh, so that is one of the challenges. Um, and then, of course, is to reform the different courses. So we have seven members. Four of us are heterodox trained, and then three of um, the faculty members, there, you know, they come from mainstream schools, even though they're very open to um, heterodox. <laughs> so what we have been trying to do is to get different um, scholars to campus and have you know, summer workshops and so on and so forth to kind of retrain and retool um, some of these you know, faculty members. And also, it's pretty much a learning by doing approach. Um, so, but again, you know, it's not an easy thing to really, um, you know, retool and repurpose our current courses without really having to, you know, hiring new faculty and so on and so forth. Um, that is not likely given the current resources. Uh, the other challenge that we used to have is, you know, trying to convince the administrators and other impact departments that you know, this is the best way we should do economics. Which came as a surprise, it's actually not very hard to convince them at all, right? To the administrator, they have no idea what we're doing. All we need to do is, you know, we're not gonna have any impact on the budget, and it will make our program very unique, you know, at the national level. And um, to other colleagues in other departments, it also came as, you know, so easy, so unbelievably, you know, smooth. Um, I think, you know, as you know, we don't have a business department, right? We don't have a business program, so that makes things very easy. And other departments, you know, if you talk to the politics uh, professors or um, history, um, they really welcome an economics program that embraces, uh, you know, pluralism, interpretation, pluralism approach, you know, than the mainstream um, approach, the very economistic approach. Um, so that's what happened um, at Willamette. Um, right now, I'm teaching, you know, macro, um, international economics, this course on income inequality and some other, you know, college colloquium, advanced topics, and so on and so forth. So I really look forward to um, maybe, you know, taking a look, of course, at your, you know, new open source textbook and also Randy's new textbook um, to reform that macro level and um, other electives. So um, that's what I have to offer. Thank you. Is it, is it permissible to stand up? So I can't think sitting down. Uh, I, I need a clicker as well, I think. I've got, some, I've got a few slides. Although what the previous speakers were talking about interested me so much, I've forgotten what to put on the slides. <laughs> uh, but we'll see. Uh, not scarcity and social provision, I'm not too sure. It's called just pedagogy. Anyway, um, I am going to tell you something, choosing my words carefully, about my life. I'm a teaching specialist in a very orthodox department. Uh, my colleagues are delightful people, but it's a lonely life. Uh, and people, I see Randy Ray at the back and uh, uh, you know, the John Paul George and Ringo of, of economics, as far as I'm concerned, Warren Moser, Randall Ray, Stephanie Kelton, and of course, Bill Mitchell, not in any order, I'm not saying them, I'm not saying who's Ringo or anything. Um, but they have changed my life and sometimes it's me against 25 other people, but I think as far as the student body is concerned, because of the work of not just those four, I, I could add Fidel and so many others, um, we're changing a lot of, a lot of lives. Um, I guess I might, I might be wrong, but I, I guess that some of the people in the room wouldn't be economists. Who's not an economist? Who's here? Okay, good. Yeah, I thought there would be a few. Uh, I don't want to spend ages on talking about the sorts of things that I discuss with my <coughs> students. Um, I, it, it's a bizarre set of circumstances that I've got a job at all. I won't explain how it happened, but somehow, through reasons that I don't understand, I'm a full-time teaching specialist in a GA, sort of elite, Australian 
university. It is the University of Geoffrey Harcourt, but we have a room named after Geoffrey, but there isn't really anything else left from the post-Keynesian days, except sort of me in the school anymore. So they all do an orthodox economics degree, very orthodox economics degree. I'm fortunate enough, being a teaching specialist, that means I teach a lot of courses. Somehow I teach first year, second year, third year, and honours, that's fourth year finance, so I am a stream. So I can be reasonably internally consistent myself, but although I love the people that teach macroeconomics in the, in the department, we disagree on virtually everything, nearly all the time, and it does create the odd difficulty for me as time goes by, because of course they're teaching orthodox economics, and if you're not an economist, then let me just tell you a little bit about the models that they work with. Basically, they assume that you as a representative household are incredibly well informed about the future. <coughs> uh, you have a great deal of power and the economy revolves around you. So if there's anything wrong with the economy, basically it's your fault. If you don't have a job, it's basically your fault. If you don't get paid a lot, it's basically your fault because it means you have a low level of productivity. In their models, you get to choose whether you work at all. You get to choose how long you work. Um, you're able to look into the future and make rational utility maximizing decisions about how much you spend and how much you save every year and what you want to buy. And because of the wonders of the free market process, what you want to buy is what's provided to you. So basically, as far as the economy is concerned, if you're an orthodox economist, it's the people that are in charge. Now, what does this involve them doing? It's, great. it's a great honour to see Paul Davison in the room. I remember, um, I remember Paul talking about uh, you needing to go behind the curtain and look at the orthodox economists put the rabbit in the hat before they in front of everybody take the rabbit out of the hat again. There are people that talk about internal inconsistencies in orthodox models. I don't bother doing that with my class. There's no point discussing internal inconsistencies with models that make no sense in the first place. Um, uh, how do their models work? Well, they make unrealistic assumptions. They derive logically predictions which are then contradicted by the data and then they sweep the data as Benoit Mandelbrot said when he was interviewed soon before his death about some issues in financial economics. They sweep it under the carpet, just ignore it, and go on. So uh, a question you might ask is why teach orthodox economics at all? Well, we'll come back to that. As far as heterodoxy is concerned, I draw on post-Keynesian economics and the work of people like, uh, like the great Paul Davidson. I draw on institutional economics too, but basically I'm a modern monetary theory teacher. That goes throughout my courses. Um, I try to take into account realistic uh, financial institutions and realistic money. Um, realistic institutions in general, realistic people, so I draw on the more heterodox bits of behavioural economics as well in my courses. And of course, inevitably, I'm going to be talking about uh, Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, because that's an important part of the story that I'm telling in finance courses as well. And what we're talking about is an economy which is basically run in the interests of swashbuckling capitalists, raising money from banks and on financial markets to um, produce goods and services in order to maximise their profits over time to end up with more money than they started with but living in an uncertain world where they'll take on workers only when they're forced to do so, as somebody said last night, and they'll pay you as little as they can consistent with maximising their profits. In other words, you don't have the power. That's not the way. You, you, that might come as a surprise to you, maybe not. It's not the way that capitalism, or at least the form of capitalism that we live with now, works. We do make assumptions, of course, when we build models, but we try and justify those assumptions and we try to make our models as realistic as we can. Certainly, we don't want models which are misleading. Um, so why teach orthodoxy at all? I have to. First of all, I have to because my students are often going for jobs at the Reserve Bank of Australia or the Treasury, and there are things that they need to know. I tell them what they need to know, I tell them what's wrong with what they need to know, and I'll be honest with you, I tell them not to say anything about that at the interview. <laughs> Otherwise they'll never get in, they just won't get a job in the first place. Uh, there is of course also the uh, uh, advantage 
if you contrast the orthodox economics with heterodox approaches and modern monetary theory in general, that if you're going to criticise the orthodox the orthodox approach, you have to thoroughly understand it. You have to understand it better than orthodox economists do. And we're winning. Our students set up an economics club earlier this year. The first four speakers were me, Phil Lorne, who's in the room at the moment, Geoffrey Harcourt, who I just mentioned, and Prue Kerr, who is Geoffrey Harcourt's co-author, who is also a post-Keynesian economist. Um, so far there have been, despite the fact that we are outnumbered about 25 to 1, there have been no orthodox economists asked to talk at the, I'm sure there will be in time, I hope so, at the Economics Club. How do we justify, how do I justify, I shouldn't be using the plural really, taking a heterodox, heterodox approach with my students. I use the John Harvey argument, even if you're going to stay a neoclassical economist, you'll be a better neoclassical economist if you understand there's more than one way of looking at the world. Um, I use the contest of ideas argument. You get people s saying to you, this happened to me last week. Um, there was a complaint. I, don't w I won't discuss it in detail now, but um, I teach students, well, I'm teaching finance, so I explain how the banking system works and how central banking works, and you end up saying the money multiplies nonsense. Um, other economics lecturers don't like you saying the money multiplies nonsense. It does create some difficulties which you have to smooth over with a coffee and a smile. <laughs> Sometimes you didn't have to go on with it. Basically, you're setting up a situation where you're having professors teaching classes and students going up to the professors and saying, what you're telling us is wrong and I can explain to you why it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a joke. This literally happens. It doesn't make you popular. Well, there are other, <laughs> there are other ways we justify what we're doing. Basically, this is, of course, from the Washington Post. I divide the world into two groups. I should, I'm terribly sorry, I should have Paul Davidson on the left-hand side. I filled in a couple of pictures, but I wanted to keep, the, keep, the, keep it a nice, a nice diagram. Uh, I am talking to the students mainly about the ideas of the people on the left. My greatest intellectual hero is Bill Mitchell. Uh, I might be a bit biased because I'm Australian these days, but um, everybody there. I have the deepest of respect for, and between them, I, I, I'd like to thank Randy, if I can, quickly, if there's time. You four have changed my life, and I like to think through me changed some other people's lives, too, in the way they understand the economy. I get right into it. I teach first, second, third, and fourth year courses. This is a, a first week of the first year question, where we're talking, you won't be able to read it now, but we're talking about the historical development of money, and I'm asking them, look, Part E, actually they're allowed to have either point of view in the tutorial, but they have to justify it. And we start discussing these things straight away. And I Australianised Eric Tamoyne's excellent new book, which he just sent me as the second edition of to look at. There's no way I'll have time until the end of term, but if it's an improvement on the first edition, it'll be absolutely fantastic. It's such a useful book. This is, this is also free. This book at the moment, I strongly recommend you take a look at it, read through it. Um, and on every course I teach, first, second, third year, postgraduate courses, you can't take anything for granted. They have to finish the course at least getting the basics of modern monetary theory, which are the three statements on the left-hand side there that I put in an article I put on the conversation, which a gratifyingly large number of people have taken a look at since the beginning of the year and if they are not also devotees of Bill's blog by the end of my course then I've failed. But it depends on your audience. I mean sometimes I'm just talking about the financial system, what I call base MMT, but I have different versions of the material I present depending on who the audience is. If I'm talking to the Green Party, it's the broadest of these. I'm going to talk about the difference between these different approaches as far as I'm concerned tomorrow, but it's always the basis, the basics of MMT that's at the centre for me. If you're going to do this, first of all you have to have a series of flukes like me to get a job in an orthodox school. It's almost impossible and I wouldn't, I, if, if I applied for my job, I'd, there's no way I'd get it. It's just by fluke I've ended up with it. You need a thick skin, you, you need a sense of humour, you mustn't take yourself too seriously. And I'm originally English, so to take a cricketing metaphor, you need to know when to let the ball go past you to the wicketkeeper. 
sometimes because sometimes people will be quite aggressive with you and the best thing to do sometimes is just let it go. Good luck if you're going to take this on. You need good luck. The good news is it's often, as I've said here, easy to discuss MMT with intelligent non-economists. If I get engineers, physicists in my class, they all end up modern monetary theories by the end, or almost every one of them. The only students that are ever difficult to persuade are the ones doing economics degrees, much though I love them all and I'm grateful <coughs> for them all for doing so. Not all of them, but some of them. The bad news is that sometimes you need that suit of armour. You do need a tough skin, and it can get you down sometimes. And uh, uh, Steve Grumbean, who's here behind the camera at the moment, he has had such a hard time from people discussing modern monetary theory online and doing the great job that he does recently. And we should all be very supportive and very grateful to him for the work that he's done in helping to spread the word and to teach our particular brand of, of heterodoxy, modern monetary theory, to a full sample of people. Thanks very much. I hope I haven't taken too much time. I'm not going to use a PowerPoint. Um, hi, my name is Fadel Kaboub. I teach at Denison University, uh, a small liberal arts college in, in Ohio. Um, and I uh, have the privilege of being a, an alumni of this, uh, this university of UMKC. Um, uh, first, I want to say thank you to all my uh, panelists here, uh, colleagues, uh, and a shout out to all the teachers in the room and those who are not in the room who have made this event possible uh, over the years, kind of building the groundwork for developing the MMT framework, developing post-Keynesian and institutional economics. Um, none of us in, in, in academic uh, circles come from departments that are 100% post-Keynesian or 100% heterodox or 100% MMT informed. Um, so it's, it's very much similar to what, what everybody described here. It's, you're most likely to be the, the only one bringing this perspective into a particular curriculum. Um, so it's, it's, it's not easy to restructure the entire curriculum to be post-Keynesian consistent or MMT consistent. But you have, you have your space, you have your, your classrooms, you have the student organizations you work with, the economics club and, and other uh, circles that can uh, introduce people to this uh, to this framework and and we're all doing this kind of work and having textbooks that allow us to pull chapters and um, pull modules to to introduce students and, and a variety of courses to these themes is, is extremely important um, <coughs> I want to say a couple of things about uh, teaching and pedagogy in general uh, and then zoom into the the MMT framework for for a little bit and then we'll open it up to to discussion um, so I come from a, a, a teaching, intensive teaching oriented university. Uh, and we, we take teaching seriously, we take the mission statement of the university seriously. Um, and when you look at mission statements from universities across the country, across the world, they usually have those really nice statements, you know, values that all of us aspire to and in general, right? Some, some not necessarily. Uh, and if you take those seriously and you say, what is my role in this institution? What is the role of the economics department to contribute towards that particular mission? And then you take it down to your own course, to the personal level. So if you, if you hear the buzzwords about education, especially liberal arts education, that is something that comes up all the time is critical thinking. How can you claim to do critical thinking honestly in the classroom if you're teaching from a, a standard economics textbook, which is a, a brainwashing tool? And if you, if you introduce this to your colleagues, and if you get your colleagues who are trained from a mainstream perspective and, and have that background, and if you just agree on what we're doing academically as teachers, let's not discuss theory and public policy and all that stuff. If we agree that in order for us to be um, honest about what we're doing in the classroom, we have to agree on that, that we, we should be teaching critical thinking, so we should be bringing alternative perspectives in the classroom. We may disagree with them, we may dis uh, criticize those perspectives, but we have to allow that space. If we're going to engage in uh, critical analysis and critical discussion, that has to be part of the curriculum somehow. And it can't be all lumped in a history of thought course that you know, a fraction of the students uh, take, or those courses sometimes don't even exist in, in, in some universities. So it has to be 
through, built into the curriculum intentionally. And it can't be just a, an upper level capstone seminar, by the way, before you leave to the real world, here are some uh, alternative perspectives. Um, and, it's, and it's challenging to draw this all the way down to the first year econ students. And I, I have to admit, I've, uh, I'm guilty of that maybe over the years with some experience and some more intentional thinking about this. Now I'm able to draw a lot of these perspectives into the Econ 101 first week, first day class discussion, including the MMT stuff, which I used to reserve more you know, towards the end of the semester. We talk about the deficit and the national debt and public policy. And that's like the last two week of classes and, and the students' eyes go like this and, and, then, and then you don't see them anymore. They go move on to other classes. So I'm now convinced that this stuff should be done from the beginning. From, from day one, and, uh, and Randy and, uh, and Bill Mitchell's textbook uh, does that from, from, from day one. You're, you're scratching the entire standard textbook model and building from a realistic perspective. Um, so there's something valuable about uh, that pluralistic perspective that you introduce in the classroom. And, and as Stephen said, it's, it's true. The students will go to your colleagues in their class and will start challenging statements and they'll have an argument, and they can support it, and they can create problems. Uh, so it depends on how, how aggressive or how polite they are, but those things can be uncomfortable. But at the same time, most of our colleagues in general suffer the consequences of their training. They're not necessarily ideologically wedded to a particular set of ideas. They just know that the textbook stuff they teach is just mechanical, analytical stuff that you need to learn but that's not necessarily what you want to apply in the real world. They don't necessarily articulate it that way to their students. Uh, and I think that's, maybe I should say it, I think that's intellectually dishonest to bring a particular theoretical framework to the classroom to students and say, uh, and not say, you know, this is what happens behind the curtain. This is how the magician, you know, put the rabbit in the hat. Uh, you have to do that at, at least to show your students that there is there is a reason why we use these assumptions. There is reasons for these simplifications, but there are also consequences. And if you don't share that pedagogical thinking that you're doing behind the scene with your students, then I think it's, a, it's an instance of intellectual academic dishonesty. You're brainwashing students into a particular way of thinking. Uh, and we, we, have to be, we have to be honest if, if, we're, if we're doing this uh, the, the right way. Um, the other thing that, uh, that's important to me uh, as, uh, as an economist, as a teacher, is that we're, at least I want to be uh, solutions oriented. Uh, the, the reason why we go through a, the university system and, and you look at it from the mission statement, we want to produce informed citizens who are gonna be active and engaged people in the world to solve problems, to address major issues. So you wanna be solutions oriented in the classroom too, in terms of the way you introduce models, the way you introduce theories and concepts. And if the problems that we deal with in the real world are complex and multifaceted problems, then the solutions that we need to introduce have to be complex and multifaceted solutions, which means they have to be interdisciplinary. They can't be just an economic solution. So as an economist in the classroom, you have to sort of force yourself outside of those boundaries and challenge your students and challenge your colleagues in other courses to build those connections and kind of to reintroduce, reinvent what Adam Smith and the classical economists used to do. I mean, they were not economists, they were moral philosophers who thought and wrote about history and politics and the legal system and ethics and religion and astronomy and economics, of course, and, and other issues, and psychology. Because all of those things come into one simple grid, complex grid, I should say, that helps us unpack the complexities of the real world. And if we, if we don't attempt to rebuild that complex toolbox, interdisciplinary toolbox, then we're, we're still limited in our way of addressing real world problems. Uh, and, and that's another challenge to do this in a standard economics department and to introduce interdisciplinary teaching. Uh, it's, it's less challenging in liberal arts colleges that value the interdisciplinary approach. Uh, but it's definitely a challenge in, uh, in most even uh, progressive heterodox uh, oriented departments. Uh, so that's something that we need to, to work on. 
Um, then I want to say that teaching for me uh, and the teaching pedagogy that goes with it uh, is, is not, none of us is trained in teaching. We're trained as economists. Um, and it's a lot of discovery on your own. You're thrown in the classroom and, and now you're supposed to deliver and educate the next you know, set of generations into you know, becoming informed citizens and engage people in, in the real world to solve real world problems. Not a lot of thought is put into how do you deliver the message? How do you deliver content? Um, very few universities have maybe a, a module or something like this, a prep course or a workshop for, for graduate students. By the way, this is how you teach. Uh, so it's a lot of discovery on your own. Uh, and that's, uh, that's fundamentally wrong. Right? If, if we take academia seriously, if we take Univ the university system seriously, we have to think of the teaching, training teachers as a, as a serious thing. And we're, we're overstretched. I mean, the, the MMT community, the post Keynesian community, we're, we're trying to write textbooks, we're trying to talk to the media, we're trying to teach our own courses, we have our own personal lives, and at the same time, we have to add all of these different layers. So we need the numbers, uh, we need more people um, to, to take some of the workload and, and help us build this, uh, uh, this approach. Uh, not just in the academic world, but we need people in the media. We need people to take this to the streets, so to speak, and, and, and Steve is, uh, is doing a great job uh, on, on this. Because you can't, if, if you look at major turning points in the history of, of the world, pol politically speaking, uh, the comeback of neoliberals with Reagan and Thatcher, they didn't win this based on uh, an academic theoretical debate that they settled and won and said, now we dominate. They won because they had a narrative and their timing was perfect for that narrative to work. Uh, the masses didn't join you know, the neoliberal movement because, because they were convinced on a theoretical argument or empirical argument because the narrative that was brought to them politically through the media, through political campaigns, was hopeful, was made some sort of sense to the general public. So if we're going to reverse that, we're not gonna settle this in the classroom. We're not gonna settle this at academic conferences. We're not gonna settle this in academic journals. Because um, we've, we've done a lot of that and I think a lot of those things have been settled, academically speaking. So if we don't build the narrative, the public policy narrative, the media narrative, take it to the general public, we're, we're wasting our time. Um, so education is important. We need to you know, introduce the, the students and the, 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 the general public that goes through the academic system to these ideas, but it shouldn't be limited to the classroom. It should be taken and practiced uh, uh, outside the classroom. Even if you're successful at getting a political candidate to sit down and listen and understand 100% what you're trying to present, that political candidate will say, well, now get me a mass movement to understand this. I'm not gonna be the one to stand up there and say taxes don't fund government spending or anything like that. Get me a critical mass of people who understand it and then I'll come out and say it. And that's when I say, well, if I have a critical mass, then I don't need you. I have a movement. <laughs> so it's, it's, but it's important to do. It's important to do both. It's important to have these, you know, closeted policymakers who understand how it works, and and slowly engage in that narrative, and and that public policymaker will not engage in that kind of conversation unless they know, if they stand up and say something truly progressive that builds on some of the ideas that we have here then they know there's gonna be quite a few people in the media who will come out and, and fight back and, and counter some of those arguments. There's gonna be a popular movement that will say, hey, we understand how this works. You're not gonna trick us into silence. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the classroom, the, the teaching method, the delivery, uh, but also outside the classroom, uh, engaging the public, engaging people who are actually living the consequences of neoliberal um, political economy. Um, in terms of uh, delivering, communicating the message, um, how many people here study communication? A couple, right? 
we need hundreds, right? Um, so in the classroom, when I introduce MMT or functional finance as approach, it, it, with 101 students or with intermediate students or with, with advanced students, or even with general public, I, public lectures, the general audience that never heard about MMT, it takes about an hour to you know, scratch the surface of the big, big ideas maybe three or four class sessions to really dig deep into and, and cover all the bases, you know, the inflation thing and the wages and all of those issues. And then the inevitable question comes almost every single class, every single semester. If this makes so much sense and we've answered all these questions, why is it that the rest of the world doesn't understand this? This is pretty logical, pretty straightforward. And it, my answer, maybe you have better answers, is if you can, as a political candidate or, or as anybody, if you can deliver what I delivered in those three hours in a, a 60 second sound bite, I'll give you the Nobel Prize for communication. <laughs> and we, we need that. So we need to pitch these ideas in a much more effective way. And we need to be careful about how we're pitching it so that we're not delivering the wrong information. So it has to be as close to complete delivery as possible in as short amount of time as possible. And we have to learn how to del deliver it to diff different people. Uh, pitching the ideas to an academic audience is one thing. Pitching it to the general public is another thing. Pitching it to policymakers or the media is another thing. So there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. And it's communication and it's pedagogy. It's thinking about how you deliver a particular concept in the most accessible way um, to people of, of a variety of, of backgrounds in different contexts. Uh, so that's, that's a challenge for, for all of us to keep pushing uh, in, that, in that direction. And then finally, um, I want to, if, if I have a, maybe a couple minutes, I want to bring a, a slightly different approach to, to introducing MMT, introducing some of these ideas in the Job Guarantee Program. Um, something that uh, Warren Mosler pitched at first and then uh, Randy Ray and others implemented here at UMKC, which is the, the Buckaroo program, which is a hands-on approach to learning how a monetary system actually operates, learning how money is created, how money enters the system, how money um, is destroyed in the system, how wages are set, and, and so on, and how you can implement a buffer stock program, a full employment program. Um, so the, the buckaroo program, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, buck, the, the kangaroos are, are the UMKC symbol. Maybe there's an Australian connection there. Um, uh, maybe, yeah. No, not maybe. It is. Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, so it's a, it's a currency system um, where the economics department issues a currency. Uh, so it's a, it's a sovereign issue of a currency. Uh, and students taking econ classes and possibly other classes as part of their course requirement are supposed to pay a tax denominated in that currency. Um, and the only way to earn uh, a buckaroo, to earn the currency, is to do one hour of useful productive work in the community, right? So lots of useful productive work done in the nonprofit uh, uh, world uh, surrounding this campus. So the students go and do the work get paid and then pay their taxes in the classroom. There was no way for any student to ever be able to pay the tax, especially on that very first semester when the system was introduced. How can you pay the tax if the government hasn't already spent it into existence? So I do this and uh, I, I was part of uh, the Buckaroo system as a student and now as a, as a faculty member at, at Denison, we have something called the Denison Volunteer Dollars Program, which is a very similar uh, program. And I always start the discussion with that very first semester, the logical question. Can you pay the tax on that first semester before the department has even spent the money into existence? And then a light bulb goes on. And then you say, can the econ department have a surplus in that first semester? And another light bulb goes on. Can the econ department balance the budget every single year? And what will be the consequence? of that to the system that you're trying to implement. You start asking these questions and kind of forcing the students to think realistically with a hands-on approach how a monetary system operates. 
and then you take it to the real world and then say, what if we have one of these, you know, IMF advisors or, you know, Rogoff advisors who says, you need to put a limit on your national debt. You need to put a limit on the government deficit and impose this on the econ department. And then some of you, the students, will show up to do useful, productive work that we want to be done in the community. And the treasurer of the department says, you know what, we, we have a limit of 60% or 3% deficit. Too bad, you guys have to be unemployed this year. And all the useful, productive work that the community needs will have to go unmet. So you bring these discussions and then the students definitely understand the mechanics, but then they get really <coughs> angry, angry at the system. And then that opens up discussion for all kinds of other uh, interesting um, uh, real world public policy discussions. It just reverses the, what most people think is the logical thinking because everybody hears it all the time. It's taxpayers' money that pays for the police officers and the firefighters and we can't afford this and we can't afford that and we can't afford that unless if we tax more. Right? Once you undo that narrative, then you also have to build a new narrative. Right? And you have to communicate that narrative in less than three hours. Right? And, and that's, that's our challenge, to, to move our discipline into this. And we need a lot of other colleagues from other disciplines, um, which, which in the last few years we were successful at doing that. And you see it in, in, this, in this event with people from a legal background, people from uh, the humanities, will be a panel on this, uh, to change the narrative in, in popular culture to challenge your grandparents when they say, well, you can't do that because we're going to have hyperinflation. Right? Uh, that's not something that we economists are going to settle. That's going to be ha settled in popular culture, too. Um, and that's how you redo uh, and recreate a, a new progressive narrative for a, for a progressive era. Thank you. Already, I would like to thank the panel. And we have about uh, 30 minutes for questions. And uh, Steve, <laughs> so I'll just uh, pass around the mic. Ma raise your hand again. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. If you have, okay. So we'll take maybe a couple questions and then three at a time. At a time. Okay. We'll take three questions at a time and then, uh, and then the panel can answer, okay? So. And please, uh, since this is recording, if you can state your name and institution before your question, that'd be great. Unless you want to be an anonymous, sure. Hello, I, I'm really excited to be here. My name's Steve Grumbine. I am with Real Progressives, and um, I've had Fidel and Stephen Hale on with me, and I've met the rest of you. It's been very exciting. One of the things that I want to make sure that, that I hear from you all in, in some sort of fashion is, as we go out there, you know, amongst the activists, speaking to different political parties and so forth, we get a lot of narratives that I don't know that the academic community typically has to deal with. Um, a lot of them are very strange myths and legends, maybe not even good neoclassical ones. They're just come up from the campfire. And so we end up having to try to bite size these things into very, very tiny bumper sticker packages just to get their five seconds of attention that they'll give us. And so what I'm trying to understand is, is that as the orthodoxy has beaten you over the head, made it uh, very difficult to maintain employment and so forth if you speak out in a heterodox way, at the activist level, at the street level, talking to voters, talking to friends and family, we find that our own people are the worst critics ever. It's like if you don't say something particular, and you guys get paid to be specific. We on the grassroots level are trying to convey messages. How do you propose to work with the street, so to speak, to help provide air cover for them, and vice versa, how can we provide air cover to you so that you can, in turn, be more bold in your message, and we can, in turn, point to you and say, see, he said it. <laughs> That's what we're looking for. I, I, I mean, I've used the term taxes don't fund spending, which causes people's heads to explode for whatever unbelievable reason. Um, but this is something that has captured the minds of regular people. Can, can you talk to us a little bit about the, the difficulties of oversimplification 
and possibly the conveying of that message to the average person as heterodox instructors and economists? Thank you. I'm Paul Davidson, and I want to, the problem is how we teach microeconomics. And let's get realistic. In a non-integrated chain of supply, in the real world, how does the entrepreneur in the chain decide how much to produce for the market? In, in, in the neoclassical economics, he knows the demand curve, and he, he knows the future, and he knows the market, and that's how he does it. But in the real world, what happens? is that the entrepreneur sells what I would call a forward purchase money contract. And then he produces based on the number of customers that enter into these contractual arrangements. So that uh, in terms of uh, the average entrepreneur making a decision on production, it's based on contracts, except at the retail level perhaps, where they sell out of inventory more often than the other. So why don't we introduce in microeconomics the idea that mo money contracts for demand for products is, is one of the great incentives for producing. If you don't get a money contract, you don't produce. If you don't produce, you don't hire. Where is the discussion of the role of money contracts? And then once you have the discussion of the role of money contracts, the question becomes, what's the role of money? with money contracts, which I'll talk about this afternoon. Thank you, Professor Davidson. And then we have, okay. Um, uh, Robert Skodelsky. Um, the question I'd like to put to all, all the panelists is what assumptions do you make in your teaching about individual behavior? Because if you drop the uh, opt optimization as the base of the economic system, what do you replace it with? Um, what is the realistic, what is a realistic perspective um, on behavior? Um, it doesn't seem to be sufficient to say, well, we know things are very complex um, and um, because we know that already. I mean, you don't have to have a lot of e economics teachers to tell you that. So what is the core assumption about behavior, individual behavior? Is there one? Um, I'd just like to have your views on that, because it seems to me that's the heart of the problem. If you believe that economics in some way is an autonomous discipline, it's got to give a robust answer to that question. Whether you start with microeconomics and try to microfound um, the subject in a particular way, or whether you start with macroeconomics, seems to me something well worth talking about. Alrighty, thank you. So the three questions, uh, uh, Steve, how do you propose to work with people on the street, and how can people on the street help work with you guys, you can both convey your message. Paul Davidson, how do we introduce micro contracts as an incentive to produce, and how does money relate with that? And then Robert Skidelsky on assumptions of individual behavior, and if we drop that, what do we replace it with in the core uh, assumptions of behaviors in this alternative heterodox model? So whomever wants to take it. Well, I think all three of these questions are really tightly intertwined. Uh, I think, you know, I, I just witnessed a panel on constitutional crisis at Cornell on Monday, and one of the one of the themes there is that the Constitution itself was really written from an individual sort of perspective. It's so intertwined within the way that we think about everything in society and how it works, and that's really the easiest part of the neoliberal story, right? All of us can understand working hard and things from our own perspective. The real challenge is what role do we play within our families, within our work environments, within our communities, and how do those individual behaviors impact others and others' behaviors impact us? And so really, the way that I teach it in my micro classes from this ontological perspective, this theory of reality, that 
society is something more than just the aggregation of individual decision making. It's, it's more than, you know, the whole is something more than just the sum of its parts. And so really our question is, if that is the case and there is relationships between ourselves and the structures and our environments, what are, what's the something greater than the sum of its parts and how do we promote that in our decision making process? How do we be actively altruistic human beings and cooperative? Is it really the, the way that the world works that we should all be competing against each other all of the time? And, and students seem to gravitate to that idea pretty easily that, you know, every decision that you make during the course of a day, can you find one example where it's an isolated decision and it's not impacting somebody around you in some sort of either meaningful or secondary factor? I think one of my favorite answers that a student gave was uh, breathing. And I said, well, I sure hope your mom's glad you're breathing. And the whole <laughs> class was like, yeah, you know, everything that we do is just interconnected to everything else. And so we need stories, we need narratives, we need laws and institutions that promote this idea of how human beings are organized. And I think that that makes things much easier. And running a, a buckaroo program in my classes, I haven't been able to institutionalize it yet at Cortland to the Cortland currency or anything of that. I, I call it the Benjamin since I'm Benjamin Wilson. Uh, it's all about the Benjamins, y'all. Uh, cash rules everything around me. Uh, and students get that. Uh, they have a good time with it. And uh, the next step is, as part of the advisory panel on the Institute for Civic Engagement, is to push this to an inst institutionalized form of the university. Uh, in their interdisciplinary programming, and we're exploring the possibility of a four plus one master's degree that would be interdisciplinary in nature, that would train students in some, uh, you know, applied tools, et cetera, that we're very excited about. So, um, yes, I intertwine those sorts of discussions into my 301 class, very much a comparative analysis of the firm uh, the neoclassical idea versus heterodox inter interpretations and money and uh, and then to the activist question, I think our students are the ones that have to do that for us. You know, they have to be going back at Thanksgiving and talking to Uncle John and Aunt Sarah and saying, you know, you guys, this isn't so complicated. We can do a lot more than what we're doing. And when people hear it from somebody other than an academic or somebody that they think is trying to sell them something, uh, it's much more powerful. So. Great remarks, Ben. Um, so I'll start with the activist question, and I may not be the best interface with the public, um, but I found that you have to know your audience. And if I'm talking to someone online or, or someone I've just met on the street uh, about this stuff, uh, and they ask me questions, and they've, they've signaled that they're curious, I don't go to the technical operational details immediately and start saying, no, these are private sector non, you know, you know net financial assets and all that because I'm going to lose them. So instead, I start, I start with very simple ideas such as the, the sort of buckaroo model. Like that's a really way to start, you know, using the sort of Adam Smith's Prince model is a really good way to start. Um, you don't want to be ascetic. You don't want to be, you know, uh, combative and say you don't know anything. You don't know anything. It's better to say it's better to draw on Mark Twain and say it's not what you don't know. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And so you can be sort of folksy with it. Bring them in. It's a it's a strategy. And so um, and then and then once you've got them in your in your nexus, then you can point them to this, you know, modern modern money network, for instance, which is going to have a lot of content hosted and you know a little bit more of the rigorous stuff, and then they can study it module by module by module. And so that's that's the only thing that I would say on that. Um, to Paul Davidson's question, um, I don't start with a representative firm from a neoclassical uh, micro textbook because there's no role for money and there's no role for contracts there. Um, and so in our textbook that we've just written, um, we take the megacorp, the sort of Eichnerian model of the firm as a going concern as our you know point of departure, as our central object of analysis. And then once you set up the question, well, uh, the, how does a firm intend to survive and how does it participate in markets and try to influence markets, you necessarily have to bring in money contracts in, in a world of uncertainty. So I think, I think ditching even the representative agent as a consumer as a point of analysis and just going straight to the big corporate firm is a good way to 
to bring that money discussion into the fold. Um, although I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that we have to do a lot more work in our advanced level textbook to talk about the nature of money contracts for sure. Let me just say, yeah. What's liquidity? Why do people worry about liquidity except for the fact that if you're liquid, you can always meet your contractual obligations? And everybody in this yeah. room, how do you know that you have enough money in your checking account to meet your contracts that you're going to be paying? We spend all our time making sure that we have enough money that we have what James called liquidity. Mm -hmm. and that's the essence of a money using economy. If you don't have liquidity, you're out of business. You're at the gallop. Right. That's a good point. And then to uh, Lord Skidelsky's question, um, I don't think you micro-found this stuff. I think if you start from micro-foundations and build up, you, you're never going to be able to answer the question in a satisfactorily robust manner. I think what you do instead is say, look at the economy as a whole, and we can sort of interrogate some structural and interstitial aspects of it. But if you want to understand human behavior, we've got to go interdisciplinary. Okay, so we, so we bring in the humanities, we bring in sociology and psychology and, you know, economics and start to talk about how do, how do people make decisions in an instituted set of processes that are embedded in social networks that, um, that are sort of ongoing and, and subject to evolution. And that's far more complicated and nuanced, but I don't think there's a model that replaces yeah, it. Well, but we must make some assumptions somewhere about what reasonable behavior is. Right. Uh, you can't just say, well, we're, we're, we, all, we all live in packs, and therefore, you know, we, we, we just behave in, in the way the pack well, indicates. Uh, there, is, there must be some assumption about what is reasonable in this kind of context I, that I, you must make. Yeah. But do you? Yeah, I think you can. I mean, I, th I think that you can say there are structural aspects, and then there are, there's a role that an individual can play as an innovator in that in that in that. that sort of on, on the sort of margin. And there are a set of like well-settled, fairly economistic behaviors that are institutionally derived. And so people will tend to follow this because there's a, a given logic to it, but it's not wholly deterministic. And so that, that, that tension is the teaching point, I think. So, and I'll pass the mic. Um, yeah, they were great questions. Um, as far as uh, uh, Robert Skidelsky's questions is concerned, uh, what I, I suppose not in a very formal way, perhaps that's not my job, but what I, um, when I talk about individual behaviour with my students, I argue that um, we do the best we can based on uh, the informational um, limitations we've, we're faced with living in an uncertain, complex world and based on our cognitive limitations as well. I then go on to the work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky which I, in my mind, is as important as modern, mon as modern monetary theory. Uh, and for most purposes, you can put up against expected utility theory. It deals with most of the same questions, and it, for me, it deals with them better. It involves also talking about the distinction between uh, what's sometimes called uh, system one and system two thinking, what, what Kahneman calls fast thinking and slow thinking. And um, so we are capable of, uh, of thinking carefully through a problem or a decision and being deliberative and being optimizing, but it's not habitually how we work and it wouldn't have been evolutionary efficient for us to, ve to develop a brain to work like that. And we are always, even when we're employing deliberative thinking and orthodox economists that I talk to, this, that what comes to mind here, um, we're always influenced by our fast thinking, system one thinking, the things we take for granted, the shortcuts, the heuristics, our emotions. You challenge an orthodox economist on something that they hold dear to their heart. You don't always get back a rational, optimizing response. <laughs> so that, that's how I talk about human behavior with, with my students. Um, uh, Professor Davidson, that uh, great question. Um, or m my only answers to it. First of all, I've, I've, I've learned a huge amount from, from you about so many issues, including the importance of forward contracts and liquidity and money, and I've read so many of your books and papers. I just mentioned behavioral economics. I remember a paper by you explaining that Keynes was the first behavioral economist, which, which was, a, which, which was a, a great read. And in terms of um, uh, uh, 
people needing to be liquid and to be able to meet their obligations. Well, that's about security, that's very important, and I think you've just made a good argument for a job guarantee in, in, in that statement, uh, coming out from my perspective. As far as Steve is concerned, you don't need to win the argument with everyone. You just need to win the argument with most people, and I think, perhaps this is a contrarian thing to say, but I think we are winning, and I think we're doing it remarkably quickly. It took, when did they form the Mont Pelerin Society? And when were Thatcher and Reagan? elected. It didn't happen overnight. This isn't going to happen overnight either. And people of you, you're in my generation, I hope we live to see uh, a US economy with full employment, permanent full employment, a job guarantee, a functional finance perspective. But if we don't, we'll just have to keep talking about this and wait for people younger than us to deliver it. And we, if we're not going to stop, we have to be as determined as Milton Friedman and his friends were <coughs> down to the day. Well, I'll second everything my, my colleague said, uh, said about uh, the, those questions. And, and Steve, I, I like your uh, offensive militaristic uh, metaphor about the air cover. Uh, I'll just add that, you know, Reagan and Thatcher, who provided the air cover for them? It's, it's people who were in the minority in academic departments for, for a long time. Uh, and that's, so the narrative is what changed it. But you do need the air cover. You need the, the academic, you know, papers. We're just outnumbered. You know, when, when somebody throws one of those myths, there's, you know, 2,600 think tanks with thousands of papers saying that this is what causes inflation and this is why we shouldn't do a job guarantee and so on. So we'll just have to keep at it um, and, until we, we build that critical mass, both in the <coughs> streets and policy making in the media, but also academically. Um, so that's, that's why this, this event is, uh, is important. Um, I'll, I'll second what, uh, what's been said about um, money contracts and, and micro, so I'll, I'll, in, the, in the interest of time, I'll just want to say one thing about uh, uh, Professor Skidelsky's question. Um, and I, I did mention in my, in my remarks the importance of interdisciplinary thinking, the importance of going back to the classical economists. And this is, this is a place where it's really important to draw on Adam Smith, because he struggled with that question almost all his life, and he didn't really give us an answer. He died before giving us an answer. It's the, the Adam Smith problem. And this is, this is our problem in the discipline that we're just drawing from the wealth of nations, and we're not really into the theory of moral sentiments, where a lot of these really painful thought processes are, are happening, and we're still struggling with those today. So in the classroom, what I, what I learned to do over the years, because I, I want to bring that to the 101 discussion, not later in the history of thought type of discussion, is to take this to other fields, because we're not the only ones struggling with this. The micro-macro debate is also a macro-micro debate in sociology and anthropology. It's a philosophy of science type of debate, the structure versus agency type of uh, debate. So if, and this is again, showing the students what's happening behind the scenes, and saying this is why we're teaching micro first, and then we're teaching you macro. But that doesn't have to be that way. We can also do macro first and then micro. The real world doesn't have macro and micro. Well, these, are, these are techniques that we introduce for analytical purposes. So you have to unpack the pedagogy for the students so that you're not tricking them into a universal way of understanding human behavior. And if, and if you don't do that out in the open in the classroom, I think it's intellectually dishonest to trick students into thinking you have to learn this, then that, otherwise it's not science, uh, and make those implicit assumptions about human behavior. Could I want to say one thing about student loans? Before you can get buckaroos, you've got to enter into a contract called tuition. <laughs> students don't, haven't paid their taxes, They're not, so they haven't paid taxes, so they don't have the money. We give them the money in a student loan, and that, so that creates jobs for most of the people here in the now, they default. Why do they default? And what does that implication for the whole economy? We, you can bet your life the next big default system is going to be student defaults. Um, so, yeah, I agree all um, the good points. Um, I just wanted to add quickly a few things. The first one about conveying the messages to, you know, the. On, for the people on the street. One thing I think, you know, um, is to really understand the concerns of these people. Um, you know, I come from Portland, Oregon, 
And so a lot of people、um, in the states they have a very specific, you know, skepticism against the government for the good or for the bad. So I think one of the things is really stem from their perspective and know what their actual concerns are, right? Job security or you know the homeless problem and so on and so forth. And then I think that could lead to a very productive conversation about you know what you can expect the governments to do and how to make it happen. And so I think really you know instead of talk, taking a top-down approach, right, tell them a, about what the government can do. It's really from the bottom up to understand their concerns and. You know, sort of follow their 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 way of thinking.、Um, the second point,、um, teaching micro. So, unfortunately, my department, I think,、um, the professors who teach micro, they really follow.、Um, you know, we have Robin Hanel right now as a guest、uh, visiting. You know, as a professor. So, a lot of the、um, talking right now is to go back to the Strathian sort of production function and so and, and sort of. Production theory,、um, but of course, you know, Minsky called it, you know, the, the helmet without the princess. So I think it's a way for us to engage in the conversation, you know, how to contextualize, you know, production decisions、uh, within the monetary sort of, you know, economy. So that's something that we, you know, are continuing forming the conversations about. And then the final question, I think, you know, Stephen、um, hit right on the point. I think for the students, it's important to package that narrative to talk about instead of individual ra- rationality, but more so boundary rationality, recognizing the imp- importance of information, you know, and the limitations, and also talking about social, you know, rationality.、Um, it's really to talk about how we contextualize our decision making in that social fabric. I think that's probably the most productive way to, you know, convey to the students. Alrighty, we only have a few minutes left, but maybe one. Brief question. I saw this gentleman's hand up.、Oh. Not a question so much.、Um, I became aware of、uh, MMT in 2011, and it changed my life. Like it has for so many people. You know, you wake up one day and you realize, oh my God, 90 percent of the arguments in Washington could go away if we all knew about this. That led me to run for Congress in 2014 in South Carolina, and in 2016, and I'm going to do it again in 2018. And I'm here mostly, like Steve, we're looking for the bumper sticker. I need a bumper sticker. I need a series of bumper stickers that are going to lead people、uh, to question their reality and go on from there. And actually, even when I'm ca- campaigning out there, I don't try to push MMT on people at all. I do what you just said right there about talking to people about what their daily concerns are, and it really comes down to 80% of us are living paycheck to paycheck. What are we actually going to do? But if you can explain how MMT solves that problem for so many people, that's it. So、uh, if you have any ideas for bumper stickers or 30-second animations or you know memes that we can get out there, that、uh, I mean, talk to me, talk to Steve. There's a few of us here that are really looking for this, and I, that's really what we need to get out of this. We got like 10 years before we get too much carbon in the atmosphere and Earth becomes Venus. And that's the way I'm looking at this. We got to fix this problem in the next ten years. Thanks. Alrighty, well, let's give a big round of applause to the panel and all the good discussion. <laughs>